Well, welcome to the Back to Basics in Venture Technology. It is a webinar being presented by our very own Dennis Urban, CDT, Director of Clinical Education. Dennis has brings 40 plus years of dental technology field experience, including lab management, technical training, sales and marketing, product development, and quality assurance. In addition to being a seasoned dental lab manager, Dennis has been an eminent lecturer worldwide since 1985. His lectures and courses span many areas of dental technology, including denture setups, digital technology, denture processing, lab management, implant over dentures, M bar design protocol, all on four and six case planning and chair side conversions, shade communication, occlusion, and soft liners. His technical articles have been published in publications across the US, Canada, and Europe. Dennis Urban has been president of both the Long Island Dental Laboratory Association and the Dental Laboratory Association in the state of New York. He has served as a Cal Lab board member and is the past board president on the National Board of Certification and serves on the advisory board for IDT Magazine. And now I get to say, take it away, Dennis. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you for everybody for uh, attending tonight. And tonight I'm broadcasting remotely from Boston, Massachusetts at the Yankee Dental Meeting, you know, and uh, they haven't had them this meeting in a few years and they had it again this week. Unfortunately, there's a blizzard coming in, in about a day and a half here. So I'm getting out of town tomorrow to go back to New York and we're gonna get hit pretty hard. But uh, tonight we're gonna talk about back to basics and denture technology. This is a course I put together a while ago and uh, just talking about the basics on dentures, what to do, what's, how I've been successful with them. And um, and we're not gonna get into the digital tonight. We got to talk about that the other night a little bit and there's a whole presentation just dedicated to digital too. So tonight's gonna be back to basics on traditional denture technology. We went through that already. Again, Jessica told you about me, Dennis Urban, CDT. I've been around, uh, I'm getting old. You know, I think I'm getting the hang of the uh, of dentures though. After doing 75,000 dentures, no exaggeration over the years, I think I have, to, I get getting the knack. So, uh, and as a disclosure, I am a full-time employee of National Dentex Corporation. If anybody has any uh, questions or concerns, you can email me at durban at uh, uh, dentalservices.net. Thank you so much. And we're gonna get started here. And we're going to talk about, you know, we come about, we come a long way with denture technology, you know, and I'm going to show you some cool photos here. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, of course, you, on the top here, you can see George Washington's dentures made out of lead and whalebone. And on, you see some vulcanite dentures on the, on the lower half of the screen, like a rubberized type of dentures back in the 50s and 60s. And, uh, you know, we come a long way with materials, and uh, which is great. Because so on, on the uh, on other phases of, of dentistry, we, we really advanced quickly, you know, and with dentures, it took a little longer. So now we're at the point now with digital dentures and, and, and the materials that we're using, we, it's uh, superior. You know, patients look like they're not wearing dentures anymore. So this is cool. Ever wonder why no pictures ever show George Washington smiling? Would you smile if your dentures were made out of lead and well, or carved whalebone? Imagine wearing something like that. Amazing. So... Uh, so these are some photos way back when from dental laboratories. Some of them are in, in the service. And I like to show this because courtesy of LMT magazine. And uh, look at how all these lab the laboratories are here and uh, how antiquated, you know, that's I was, I was modern back then, you know, so utilizing surveyors and mixing and uh, different, different materials and everybody's sitting at the bench there in the lower part of the screen. And um, and look at the upper part of the screen here. Look at that, uh, look at that bench over there. It's like a boil out unit and this nice casting over here. You know, just before induction casting. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. I mean, just, just, just look at these pictures and see where we are now. And how about this polishing machine here? Yeah. I'll tell you, the polishing machines don't look that much different today, but this is, a, this is an old polishing machine. And this is where we come. I mean, with the quality of uh, materials out on the market, this is on the left hand side, this is an upper and lower denture that I made a few years back and, uh, you know, with specialized high impact acrylic with uh, natural looking denture teeth. And you can see the materials are so much nicer now. It's just beautiful materials. Here's some other dentures with some denture based staining. Really natural looking denture teeth. We'll talk about some of the higher end denture teeth on the market with Vita uh, and V and Ivoclar and Colzer. They have such great teeth out there that you can pick choose from. A lot of a lot of different tooth companies out there to choose from. And then we have characterized wax ups, which I'll show you a little later on. This is, these are some of my characterized wax ups here for trying. And you know, I try to mimic uh, the natural gingiva of, of a patient. Uh, when we try in the dentures, so they look, they they feel like they're gonna what they're gonna see when they get that final denture, and I'll mimic that in the final acrylic or and denture based resin. 
So you can see it's pretty nice uh, wax up there. Then we have our denture-based stains where we can, we can match the patient's natural gingiva on the final denture base to really look natural. I'll show some intro uh, photos of that towards the end of the program. Uh, and uh, you can see what I'm talking about. And yes, this is a real dramatic one. This is a nice full upper full lower denture with uh, stained denture base and physio dense denture teeth. And how about the partials that are around now? This is a milled uh, CAD CAM partial, a little lighter than uh, what we used to have. We can design everything on CAD CAM. It eliminates hours and hours of work. And we even have clear partials too. So this is in my partial denture seminar, which I do. I talk about this more in depth. And look at those clear partials. They just disappear in the mouth. The aesthetics are great. They fit, it's a snap fit, it's a, it's a rigid type of system. And uh, imagine wearing this as opposed to, um, you know, uh, as far as some metal partials. So there's a lot of options out there. And have even the dog gotten involved with this, you know, with uh, cosmetic dentures for today's cosmetic world. So uh, Fido wanted to get involved also. But anyway, I'd like to get across quality materials and techniques. This is what I talk about. I feel it's a reflection of our talents and our skill. And uh, that's all I try to put forth when I'm planning a case with the doctor, what, what materials, what the right materials are to use. And what are the techniques like, in, like we talk about processing. We'll talk about a little more about processing later on. What's gonna be the best technique for the final outcome uh, for the patient. So where are we gonna be in denture technology 20 from years from now? We're growing, still growing in the denture business, you know, and, and you know, a lot of replacement dentures, a lot of people who uh, are getting implant dentures, Partial dentures are, are, are on the increase with cosmetic uh, type partial dentures. You know, the survey that was done, this is from Dental Products Report, I think a few years back, uh, and they asked dentists who would like to increase their full denture business. And it was only about 46%. And the reason being was we, I dug deeper into this and, you know, getting, getting involved with the lab associations and, and even dental associations asking, why is that only 46%? And the answers I was getting was the dentists were, a lot of dentists were in their, in their comfort level with making dentures. Um, and a lot of the dentists that came out of college in, in the last 10 years, or so, they weren't really exposed to a lot of removal technology. And then uh, also uh, adjustments. That was the number one thing. They felt like there was too many adjustments and you know, chair time, they were losing money, they were kind of married to the patient, you know, as opposed to having just a normal four or five visits, they were going into seven, eight, nine visits on, on adjustments, but uh, there's no need for that. You know, if you do everything correctly and have, use the right materials, uh, you shouldn't have that problem. And then our parcel business, it was about parcel denture business, it was about 65% of the US dentists want, uh, wanted to increase that business. And I think that was because of less adjustments and uh, less chair time also. So this is the latest survey I got less about a week and a half ago from uh, NADL. And uh, I was kind of uh, you know amazed at some of the numbers here and the percentage of full dentures that are that are um, standard across the country is about 31%. You got your premium dentures that are being done are about 25%. Then the highly aesthetic ones, which I just showed you, the ones that I do, is it's only about 15% now. And then you have your economy at there on 29. And uh, its percentage of dental sales are about 60% uh, compared to uh, metal partials and acrylic or flexible type partials. So, um, and uh, which is still a lot out there. There's still a lot out there. And the percentage of denture acrylic that is processed in various ways, uh, injection is 24%, but look at the uh, 55%. That's still the number one way to uh, process dentures. And you know, a lot of you know, times doctors say, you know, you're talking about lab procedures here. Well, I, you know, a lot of times you know, we'd come across a lot of dental, dentist, dental offices with laboratories in their office too. Uh, and uh, even I think it's important for doctors to know how we process our cases for the, the accuracy of the case. You know, so, uh, but the number one, uh, you know, is, is, uh, method is still um, uh, press pack. The most accurate method, it's injection. Then you have pour, then it's light cured and, and microwave denture uh, processing, which we'll touch on a little bit later on. But then look at this, look at, let's take a look at the digital aspect of dentures, you know, and we're evolving at such a fast rate with uh, uh, digital dentures and still, still the traditional uh, dentures are 92% of the business. Isn't that amazing? And this is the latest survey that we just got a couple of weeks ago. And this is through laboratories across the country. And it's a reflection of what you're prescribing and what they're, they're doing in their laboratories. So uh, <clears throat> traditionally manufactured is, is still about 92%. <clears throat> and then the amount of full uh, uh, denture arch cases with implants, about 78%. And then you look at the parcel. Look, look at the parcel denture aspect. Uh, that's about... Uh, Traditionally, it's still about 82%. 
But I think you're going to see a lot more in the next year or so uh, with the uh, digital partials because they're so predictable. What you see on the screen when you're, when you're designing a partial denture now is what you're going to get when you're, and same with, same with full dentures. It's what you're going to get in the final denture, whether it's milled or printed uh, and, and, or centered. You know, it's just amazing the accuracy that you see out there. But, uh, and then the percentage of that partial denture archers with uh, implant supported is about 88% compared to these other, other uh, types of dentures. So we're gonna move on and um, talk briefly about communication. And this is one of my, one of my the things that I, I concentrate on a lot when I'm, we're, we're uh, planning a denture case. And it's you know, communication between us, the technician and you with the patient. And then at times I'm, I'm involved also with the talks with the patient and I go to the dental office too. But you know, we depend on your clinical knowledge and training and the assessment of the patient, the appropriate treatment planning and detailed information on a work authorization form. We, that's just so essential for a successful case. And I like also to get a little history of the patient, maybe some of the problems they have had previously with their dentures and how we can correct that through maybe different types of occlusion, uh, different materials, and we always like to get uh, digital photography, you know, from you. And uh, so all this comes into play for a successful case. And then the communication with us, the certified dental technician, we give you our technical expertise on knowledge and procedures and materials and give you the appropriate feedback uh, on impressions, bites, shades, et cetera. And still the number one phone call we're making is on, uh, on impressions. We see a bad impression. We call up and we don't want to go forward with it because why it's, it's only going to be a remake. So we look at that uh, very closely and we do some uh, the quality control when a case comes in the laboratory because you, you don't want to proceed with the case when you see something wrong. So we say we asked our, all our technicians, and everybody who's working on this case, if they, you see something, say something, and then we'll get a new impression. So uh, and the case planning with you, the, the clinician. And of course, that digital photography, we've only even gone as far as to get little video clips of how that patient's going into various excursions if they're having trouble with occlusion. So uh, just some things to consider. And we need that collaboration between a dentist and a dental laboratory. And it's really important on success, whether it be a denture case, crown or bridge, especially on implant cases, you know, we need that collaboration. And the ability of the technologists and the dentists to work together, plan together and succeed together is paramount. You know, when you succeed, we succeed, and the patient succeeds as, as far as wearing a, an, a, a denture that's going to be uh, acceptable to them and going to enhance their way of life. And then the concept of collaboration will become fully evident. So I like to talk about the, uh, the traditional clinical protocol for removables, and usually it's about a five-visit type of uh, scenario here. So we'll go, we'll talk, we'll go through all these different steps here, and I'm going to add some you know, different aspects of occlusion, Night registrations, tooth setup, and uh, we're going to talk about different uh, methods of setting up teeth, and then the final insertion. So we have that first visit is that preliminary impression. Second visit is that custom tray final impression. The third is usually the bite registration, and then that tooth setup and wax trying is on the fourth visit. And a fourth, fourth visit, and hopefully everything goes well, and you can insert that denture without any problems. And a, a visit can be eliminated. I'm going to show you this in a minute too. If a functional impression is taken inside the occlusal rim base plate and a bite registration is taken at the same time at the second visit. So you could actually have a four visit denture, which we're trying to achieve now with digital dentures. We're trying, trying to achieve a three to four visit uh, denture on the digital dentures now too. So when you're taking your preliminary impression, you know, the first visit, it's really important to, you know, utilize a stock tray and take an impression with a quality algae material or quality impression material. And we want to make sure to capture all the anatomical landmarks because we actually need those to, 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 to make a good, accurate custom tray. So we, we don't want to be faking the areas that we're missing in an impression or, you know, we're guessing at these areas. We want to make a good qual quality custom tray for that final impression. So it's important to utilize a good impression material and, you know, to use the right tray. And there's a lot of stock trays out there now that are great. You can actually heat them up and form them. The patient's ridge a little bit better uh, and you can get a better impression for the, on a preliminary impression. This way we can make a good custom tray for that final impression. So that second, custom, uh, uh, second visit is gonna be that custom tray impression. You wanna make sure you capture all the borders, anatomical landmarks and, uh, and including retromola pads, hammerlin notches and the freno really important. So we'll talk about border molding in a second here because this is going to be important. So when we're making a tray, we make, usually use, I usually like to use a light cured custom tray material. It's, it's just strong. It's quick. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's predictable. So that's why I like to use that. 
So normally going about two to three millimeters short of the border, as you can see here. And this is gonna allow room for you to border mold the case. So when we're border molding, the method I like is to put a little adhesive on the borders, use a monophase or heavy body impression material, put it in the patient's mouth, have them move their cheeks, get all the musculature of the upper and lower, take it out of the mouth, put that adhesive on internally on a custom tray and comb over it with a you know, light body or medium body PVS material. And it seems to work really well, you know, and uh, you know, it's, it's, you can also use compound if you want. This is compound. I still, we still get a lot of compound uh, impressions with border molding. Nothing wrong with that. Whatever you're used to, whatever you're successful with and feel comfortable and are in your comfort zone at. And as long as you capture those, those, uh, uh, the, the periphery and uh, all those borders so we can have a good fitting case. Now, this is the denture I talked about earlier, the, uh, actually the uh, base plate and the occlusal rim for a functional impression and bite. And so pretty much making custom tray wax on it. You know, try to contour that wax. So when you take a, you can border mold this, take a nice impression. You can actually take it out of the mouth if you're using PVS material. And then if you need to contour the wax a little bit, you can You put it back in the mouth and get a good accurate uh, bite registration also. So that's gonna eliminate one visit for you. And this is the master model with the functional tray and the functional impression. So talking about the precision of transfer from what you give us to the articulator, the bite registration using the functional impression with therapeutically designed bite rims, is one of the most reliable ways to transfer the oral situation to the articulator. And I've seen this over the years and I'll show some photos of the setup of what we're doing with this case here uh, in a little while. That final impression, you know, use a quality material Examine it for accuracy before it goes out of the dental office. This way, you don't lose any time. You don't inconvenience the patient, maybe for a second impression or you know, if it's not accurate. So just make sure it's high quality and look at it. Make sure you captured all those anatomical landmarks so we can proceed with the case in the, in the right fashion. This is a couple of impressions here. It's a nice, ac nice accurate PVS material. Got some nice impression. Borders aren't that thick here. Border molded it slightly, but this is how the doctor wanted it and patient wanted it. Felt comfortable with their previous denture. So they took a nice impression, captured all the landmarks and that we needed. This is that functional tray, which I just showed earlier. And you can see it's a little bit more of a full roll on here. The doctor used a, used a, a PVS material, did a nice wash impression, got a nice impression, and then we also got a bite registration at the same time. And of course we bead and box all our models when it comes back in the laboratory, <clears throat> because we want to preserve everything you went through the trouble of giving us. So, uh, you know, I've been training with, for many years for laboratories across the country, even dental offices, because a lot of dental offices are pouring their own models and you go through the trouble of, of uh, taking these impressions. And sometimes the models aren't poured correctly. You're not capturing everything we need in a model or the models are trimmed at the office or they're trimmed too closely and it's just, everything's ground away. You know, we don't, you know, we want to watch out for that. It's also done in a laboratory. We have to watch out for that also. So when we, when we pouring models, you know, I've been successful over the years. I use a type three stone, like a, a buff stone or yellow stone for full cases. And the reason why I'm doing that is because when we're processing these cases, so we have to, after that process, we have to chip away that stone and break away the stone from the, from the acrylic. And we don't want the acrylic to break. So if we use like a type four stone or a die stone, sometimes it's really difficult to get the denture apart from that, that die stone because it's more comp compression strength and it's more, it's stronger. And I like to use type four for partial frames because of the wear and tear on the model of the frame coming on and off the model. So this is just uh, showing a picture of porting models with the type three stone. I just wanted to show you the color. You know, this is a, a great stone. You know, it it's works out well. A lot of companies are making this stone um, and uh, its smoothness is great. Its accuracy is a trademark really, you know, and then you have your type four stone, which I pour, it's pretty much a die stone and it's compression strength is higher has an expansion rate of about 8%, 0.08%, which is really accurate. And it's nice and strong. So you got the compressive strength so you can able to put, put on and off that, that, that uh, framework without really abrading the teeth. You know, we don't want to abrade the teeth because we want to, you know, I'm going to be utilizing this quite a bit, this model, you know, from the try-in stage, from the frame stage, from, you know, setup, and it's a lot of wear and tear on and off the model. So this is why we use this type of stone. So we got that perfect impression now. We're going to go, go back in the laboratory and make a nice occlusal rim. And occlusal rims are also made in the dental office too. So, you know, we want to make sure that if you're, you know, transferring that information to us from the patient, we'll have the right information uh, at the laboratory. 
You want to mark the midline, the high lip line, and the cuspid lines into the wax. And uh, it's really important that we, we have this information because the combination of this information that you give us uh, at, in the, at, for, at the laboratory and a good articulator, you know, we're almost, it's almost like having a patient with us at the bench. Because we have to fill that intraoral space of 40 millimeters or more, and we need all the information we can get to set up those dentro teeth. You know, so it's nice when we get a, uh, you know, we'll give you a nice contoured bite rim if you need to adjust it by adding some wax on the anterior to show us where the incisal edge should be. That's great also. So let's talk about making some bite rims. We see a lot of bite rims here on this table. Probably half of them are not made correctly. So uh, as you can see here. So uh, I want to just talk about the correct contour of a bite rim and occlusion. It's just one of the most important aspects of, of a denture. So let's talk about optimal results with proper occlusal rim techniques. So some of the functions and requirements for a, a good, accurate base plate and bite rim are as follows. You know, so what do we want to do? It's, it's actually aiding in the transfer of an accurate jaw relationship to the articulator. And those base plates, we want to simulate that finished denture base, you know, and it's utilized for that occlusal rim and the denture setup. So we're going to be using this base plate for a while, you know, for, for the bite rim, then for the setup. And then, you know, it's going to be going back and forth. So we want something that's going to be going to hold up and something's going to feel almost like the final denture to the patient. So it should be rigid and stable. You know, we still, I still see, um, you know, some of these uh, base plates being done in the laboratory, uh, doing a process base. So a lot of docs are requesting a process base, which is the actual acrylic that's going to be utilized for the denture. So, uh, and that's, that's the real intimate fit of a, a process base. It's going to fit like that final denture. And if there's a problem with that fit, you can pick it up right away and you can, you can say there's something wrong here and possibly take a, a, a new wash impression inside that, that base plate, that process base. So there's a nice finished basis here. There's a full, uh, upper and lower, full upper, full lower. Then we, we captured all the uh, landmarks here. You can see when we went over the retromolar pads a little bit, uh, but it's going to be a nice fitting denture base. And then we're going to put our, dent, our wax rims over that. So some of the occlusal rim requirements, you know, we want to place the occlusal rim in the anticipated position of the denture teeth. You know, and some of the tools that we utilize is, and I'll show you a picture of this in a minute, is the alma gauge. And the alma gauge is used because I put the alma gauge pin in the papilla of the upper uh, denture and I, I come about on an average eight to 10 milliliters from the papilla. And that's where we're gonna set our denture teeth. So when we're setting our denture, uh, when making our occlusal rim, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna do the same thing, go about eight to 10 millimeters from the papilla. I'm gonna secure that wax rim, contour it, so you don't have that much work to do in the dental office. I know I hear doctors all the time saying, oh man, we got these rims back. You know, it's like uh, 30, 30 millimeters high on the posterior, I had to cut it back and it was just spent a lot of time contouring it. We don't want to do that. If we have the right tools, uh, even with, a, um, we'll talk about a papillometer in, in a minute. You know, if we get all that information on the onset, we can contour these almost to where the patient's natural teeth were. We want to establish lip support and that correct occlusal plane. And on an arch form on, on an occlusal rim. And that's why when I'm training technicians how to do occlusal rims, I'm a real pain because I want to make sure that we're giving you that information at the, at the dental office for recording the information for the proper setting of denture teeth. So on an average, those dimensions for the uh, by rims are going to be about 20 millimeters, two millimeters from the periphery to the, at, at, on the anterior to, the, to where the wax rim ends. And that occlusal width is going to be eight to 10 millimeters. And then the anterior width is usually about three to five. So we try to try to contour this uh, on these, these upper, upper wax rims, just according to these dimensions. And on the lower, we're going from the periphery to the uh, height uh, of the wax, about 18 millimeters on an average. And that's gonna be the same kind of occlusal width and the anterior width is gonna be the same, but I try to cover the, uh, the two thirds of the retromolar pads when you take, when, for you when we send that uh, wax rim to you, that's where the second molar is gonna wind up being set. If you want a second molar set, a lot of doctors are requesting just to go to the first molar. They feel it's more comfortable with the patient. So uh, we want to talk about that a little bit more later on. So again, to review, we need this information from the dental office, the midline, canine line, smile line, and the approved occlusal plane set. You know, so we don't want to have that uh, occlusal plane and almost like a reverse smile situation because we don't. It's not going to work for us. It's going to. It's not going to look good. It's not going to be functional.
Hey, Dennis. Um, did you hit your microphone? All of a sudden, I'm I'm oh, unable yeah. to hear. It. There yeah. you go. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I had it. I, I shut it off to clear my throat. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, so some of the, one of the tools we use is uh, is a rim former, and uh, it's about five millimeters on a hamulon notch area, and um, that is uh, pretty much easy to get. So you can contour, you heat this up, you melt it down to that 22 millimeters on the anterior, and about 18, 16, 18 on the posterior. So it really works well. So there's a lot of tools you can use. This is the alma gauge, and uh, did, we're coming out about eight to 10 millimeters from the papilla. You can see I put the pin in the papilla. So it's nice and contoured, contoured correctly. And actually, this is actually a process base we see here. And then if you want to mimic the, uh, the existing denture of a patient and say, you know, the patient loves where these anterior teeth are now, they just need a new denture. The denture's been, they've had it for a long time. So let's start from scratch here. So what we do is actually there's a plastic plate that goes over, plastic uh, sheet that goes over the, uh, uh, the alma gauge. And you can see, we just take a magic marker and draw it. You could do this in the office also, send it to us at the laboratory and we'll contour that wax rim according to the exact uh, uh, measurements of that previous denture. That's pretty cool. And there's something called the cold pick template, which is great. I love this template. And it'll give you the correct width on the anterior with the slots that you see in the template, correct width on the posterior. And then what we do, you, you put this in the periphery and there's little slots there to stick your Bart Parker blade or a knife in those slots so you can cut it to the correct height. 22 millimeters or eight to 18 millimeters. It's a great tool to have in a dental office too. So all these tools really come into play when we're, um, we're making these occlusal rims, really important. Here you see it uh, being utilized again. So yeah, it allows us to correctly mark the height of the wax rim and helps us to uh, actually obtain anterior and posterior width. So it makes it more accurately uh, accurate to take, take that occlusal reg registration at the, in the dental office. And it just helps with the overall contour and, and, and age and setting of denture teeth. And uh, it's available in metal or clear. So whatever, you know, whatever is good for you. I like, I like the clear. I've been getting the clear ones now and they, they work really well. Hand them out to our technicians, they work really well. So these are the perfectly contoured pipe rims, as you see here. So this is nice to have. It's, it's, if you get, if you get to send a dental office, you're lucky, you know, because uh, a lot of labs I, uh, I, I work with over the, over the years going, I've probably been to almost every lab in the country uh, working with them and, and in dental offices also, uh, I, I try to teach this and a lot of time it's not contoured correctly. Let's talk about taking the bite registration now. So, you know, taking the bite registration, we really need to have that patient in an upright position. You can see here on the left-hand side, this patient's struggling to get into that physiological rest position. And so even though she's in it on, in that position on the right-hand side, I don't think she could repeatedly do this, uh, get that in that position. Uh, so we have to get her upright in the chair, kind of massage those temples a little bit, try to get that patient into the right position, a comfortable, repeatable position. So we talked, I talked to Bill and I about this, and this is something that I like to, when you're using, a, um, uh, you have your wax rims and then you cut those V cuts in the wax rim to hold them together. And if you put that, uh, some uh, polyvinyl material, by registration material in between, have the patient open up and see if they can repeatedly go into that position. If not, it's time to take a new by registration. We'll just put some, some more material in between because we want something that's gonna be repeatable and comfortable for the patient. We don't want the, we don't want the patient like this, want them in an upright position. And then of course we need that uh, midline, cusped line, high lip line, and low lip line is helpful too. And when we're getting that information at the laboratory, but something like this is gonna be very helpful for us. We can contour the lip line, you know, to bring out the lip a little bit, make, make it a little more fuller. All you can, you can do is all in the wax and we can mimic it in the final denture also. Control the angle of the mouth with the wax rim. You can see that on the right-hand side, it's nice and plump. The patient's filled out, eliminate some of those wrinkles. And then we want to enunciate, you know, have the, have the patient speak and pronounce different sounds, you know, the F sound or just different uh, letters of the alphabet and can help in getting the right height of contour on these occlusal rims. And you can see here, uh, you know, trying to get the right occlusal plane here, you know, we have a ruler going from the tip of the nose to the middle of the ear, that's the campus plane. Then we have the occlusal plane and you can see how it's sloping down towards the posterior region. So the doctor has to cut this back to get the right occlusal plane. And this way we'll get a good accurate by registration. This is a functional impression too, as the doctor did here. And a functional impression and a by registration at the same time. So you can see after adjusting on the lower left-hand side, we got that nice even plane of occlusion. That's what we're looking for. And then sometimes the doctors add those and the anterior region of the bite registration 
just a little bit of wax to show us where those incisal edges should uh, wind up on the anterior teeth. And that's very helpful. And at times we'll get asked to set like six anterior teeth so the doctor can maybe adjust those in the wax or even two anterior teeth is helpful. And it helps with the cant of the, of the denture. Uh, and it helps with the, uh, the level of the incisal edge also. Now, I mentioned that this tool before, this is the papilla meter tool. And uh, you know, this, is, this rests on the papilla of the patient and gives us a reading of on, on, on approximate of a level of where that incisal edge is gonna wind up. So, and this is with the patient closed. You can see it's about 17 millimeters. We add about three or four millimeters to that, but it helps us even contouring the bite rim. So when you're taking your final impression, if you can give us a papilla meter reading, we can contour that, that uh, wax rim right to where the patient needs to be. So it really works out well. So, so we got all that information now, all this accurate information. We're ready to set our denture teeth, and you know we want to make give it to you at the dental office so you can be successful with this patient also with uh, checking out the occlusion. But we have to use the right articulator. You know, there's a lot of different articulators out on the market. Straight hinge, semi-adjustable, fully adjustable. You know, straight hinge is okay for a small partial, but a full full mouth reconstruction, I like to use at least a semi-adjustable articulator. So these barn door type hinge articulators, like I, I tease, like I laugh about, they, they work. You know, a lot of labs are using them, but you know, I, if you really want to go into and check the different excursions and working and balancing, they don't really mimic true true jaw function. You know, if you can get an articulator with 110 uh, millimeters from uh, f f across, into, in, you know, that's interchondral distance, that's great. You know, so that's going to mimic true jaw function. So even these types of articulators, this is, this is a little bit better. It's a, still a hinge articulator. Uh, it's a little bit better there, but not as accurate as a fully adjustable articulator as you see here. And there's so many different articulators on the market, you know, the Artex, Whitmix, you know, Hanau, Danau, uh, so many different kinds out there, so many different manufacturers. So um, to choose from, it's according to what you want to spend also. So when we're mounting these bite registrations on, uh, on a semi-adjustable articulator, you know, the occlusal plane is using a line to the marked occlusal plane of the articulator and it's parallel to the workbench. So the center model of the model is identical to that of the articulator. What I do is I take a rubber band, put it around that incisal pin. There's a little slot in there on most articulators. There's some slots on the uh, posterior region also. And this is gonna be your plane of occlusion. This is what, how we set up these, uh, uh, these models on the articulator. Nice and accurate, as you can see here, it looks beautiful. Got the markings and the occlusal rims. Nice occlusal plane, and we're ready to do our denture setup. And you can just see it, this is the denture teeth set up on a lower, and just to show you how the even occlusal plane from the, the curve of speed from the retromolar pads, uh, the two thirds of the height of the retromolar pad. And then we can see that the upper denture is going to fall right into the place. And this is this is before waxing. Then I'm going to go into separate excursions, working, uh, working on my working and balancing, make sure there's no interference, and it's going to be functional for the patient. There we go. And we try to visualize, you know, you know with the patient, we talked about the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, occlusal plane earlier, you know, the, usually the, uh, the uh, pupil lines are equal to the occlusal plane. And you can see here, uh, we're going to about half the height of the metromolar pad here on the lower. And we want to try to visualize the patient when we're at the bench doing this, these uh, setups here. It takes a long time to do a setup. I mean, to learn how to do setups correctly. So if the tip of the nose to the middle of the ear, here you go, that's your campus plane, and that's going to be your occlusal plane. Really important. And we want to follow the bottom wall triangle with the Frankfurt, uh, Frankfurt horizontal plane, the campus line, and the occlusal plane. We're setting up these denture teeth. I'm talking about full upper and full lower. You know, a little bit different, you know, when you have to follow the patient's natural dentition if you're doing one arch at a time. So yeah, you see the campus line and the occlusal plane. Nice and accurate here, nice setup, and this should be a good functional case. And then we talk about what we talked about before, the average of the length of the anteriors is about 22 millimeters and about uh, on the lower, it's about 18 to 20 on the average dimensions. So if we, we're doing our, we're ready to do our tooth setup now. And on the fourth visit, you're gonna be trying in this wax trying. You're gonna check occlusion, phonetics, and shade. You wanna make sure there's aesthetics of pleasing to the patient also. Patient's not happy, nobody's happy as you know. So let's talk about doing some setups here. First, let's talk about what kind of denture teeth to use. You know, there's so many dental denture tooth manufacturers out there. A lot of great ones. You know, you're talking about, uh, you know, dental player, Colza, uh, Vita, Ivaclar. They all have high-end teeth that look great. 
you know, and I'm going to show some, I'm going to talk about what we should look for in the denture tube. First of all, we want something that's going to wear like natural dentition, especially if you're doing an implant case, because teeth have to wear a little faster on implant cases uh, and over denture cases, as opposed to regular full upper and full lower dentures. And of course the shade is really important. So this is a, there's a lot of shade guides out there. A lot of denture teeth manufacturers have their own shade guide. With the, and they copy the you know Vita Classical shade guide a lot of times, but it's used 80% of the time when making dentures. And if you're doing a combination case, when you're doing like, say you have a six unit bridge on the anterior and it's a 3D shade, well now there's 3D shade of denture teeth also. So you can take a 3D shade, give it to us at the laboratory and we can match that anterior bridge perfectly with a partial denture with uh, 3D master shades here. So these are two of the most popular shade guides out there, but shade is important. And it's, I think it's the third, Third reason for uh, third popular reason for remakes in in, uh, in the industry, but we're looking for a teeth that are the same size as natural teeth. I mentioned earlier, higher wear resistance, lingual anatomy for better phonetics, and I, I'm going to touch on this a little bit more. And we want to have teeth that we, uh, offer bleach shades, and 3D shades, and classic shades also. So we have that choice of giving the patient the most aesthetic looking denture and functional denture. So yeah, the anterior should mimic natural denture teeth. And you know, it has to feel and that natural to the patient's tongue. And a lot of times you know, if you get a little like an economy type tooth on a market, it's not gonna feel natural. It's not even gonna look natural. So this is, uh, I'm just showing a picture of one of the finished dentures that I did here. And you can see the nice rugae in the palate. You got that lingual anatomy on the, on the anterior teeth here. And that patient's tongue is gonna just stay there and, and, and feel natural. We actually, what we did with this particular case here is actually took an impression of the patient's existing rugae and made a wax pattern and laid it in the, uh, in the, in the palate. And so it was a natural feel in the exact position of the patient's previous rugae for this full upper and full lower. So it's really cool. And patients really, and it's, you know, many times with newer denture patients, they're getting, they're getting a full upper, full lower denture, especially on you know, the lingual of the anterior on the upper, that tooth just kind of slides off and they start lisping. It takes a while for them to speak correctly. The phonetics are not there yet. You know, so this makes this kind of accelerates that that uh, that type of uh, you know, phonetic the type of phonetics that you want. And this is uh, just putting in that rugae in a palatal area. I, I'm a strong believer. In, you know, a lot of doc doctors just say, "Give me a smooth palate." <laughs> I want something you know that's going to really feel natural to the patient. So I put the the thickness of the setup base plate or the wax base plate plus the thickness of the wax. You know, so you add about five millimeter, uh, 0.5 millimeters to that, you know, half a millimeter, and uh, you know, it's this way you have the right thickness. And it's going to be feel natural to the patient, as opposed to on the left hand side, a smooth denture, a you know, smooth palate. And you can see, you know, waxing this in place and before it's processed and after it's processed, you know, and after the polishing, you know, look how look how nice it's nice and smooth. I think over the years, what happened with a lot of patients, you know, a lot, a lot of labs were putting these rugae in, not polishing it correctly, they felt rough to the patient. You have to get something that's going to really feel smooth and natural, like what you see here on the right hand side. So when we talk about posterior tooth criteria, you know, I'd like to use a functional cuspal inclination of about 20 to 33 degrees. I'll use, sometimes I'll use a 15 degree. If the patient's in a severe class three, I might even use a five degree. I try to stay away from the zero degree teeth. We want something with better tearing and chewing capabilities, a wider occlusal surface, especially for partial dentures. How many times have you seen a partial denture where the, the occlusal surface is so narrow, it doesn't even look like a natural tooth. So we want something that's gonna have a wider occlusal plane so the patient can chew better. So speaking of teeth, now how do we select these anterior teeth? Well, we have to determine the mold and, and you know the anterior mold, a lot of times I'll, I'll go by the shape of the arch and the shape of the arch is usually the, the shape of the, end, of the centrals and whether it be a, a square tapering ovoid, square tapering ovoid, all these years when I'm setting over 40 years when I'm setting and picking out denture teeth, I go by the shape of the arch and we can use them to go by the, uh, we can measure the cuspid to cuspid lines on the bite block that you sent in also. And then with that, we go to the uh, tooth chart and then, <clears throat> excuse me, as we go to the tooth chart and they give us an idea of what kind of teeth to utilize. And I'll show you in that in a second here, but look at the shape of the arch here. So this is more of a square tapering. If you just visualize it, it almost looks like a central. You got the cervical area, the incisal edge, so this is what I'm going to look for when I'm picking my denture teeth out, you know? So, uh, but this, in addition to taking that measurement on the occlusal rim, you can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. So, uh, and there's, this happens to be a VitaPan tooth chart here, but there's, you know, the, all the other companies, you know, uh, Ivoclar and Colzer and all the other ones out there also give you these tooth charts. And you can see, it's hard to see here, but 
whatever anterior tooth, they're going to recommend the posterior tooth that goes along with it. They'll give you the upper anteriors, the lower anteriors, and the posteriors. So it's, that's helpful also. And tooth form equals face facial forms. So usually the shape of the face is what you're going to get, you know, what you, what you get when you have your anterior, your, your centrals. And, uh, you know, I, I follow this rule also over the years, especially when we have our digital photography. We have a picture at the bench with me of the patient, and I can decide looking at the arch, the information I got from the clinician uh, on a occlusal rib and a picture, I can really pick out the correct tooth. Again, square face, square tooth, tapering, tapering tooth, and so forth. So we're going to talk about denture, setting the denture teeth, and uh, there's a lot of different methods of doing this. I'm going to show, I'm going to have a, a lot of time tonight, so I'm going to just talk about one of the methods here. Let me just make sure I have enough time here. Yep, I'm good to go. So we want something that's going to be harmonious and aesthetic. So I want to set up those anteriors first. I usually set up my anteriors first, then my upper anteriors, lower anteriors, and I go from upper and lower, upper and lower. I'm going to show you a little, something a little bit different tonight. So those anteriors are positioned individually, and they're parallel to the pupil line. Let me go back there. I'm too fast with that. As you can see here, the lower incisal edges are parallel to the upper incisal edges when you're setting these teeth. And when I'm teaching how to do setups, I, you know, I, I mark the crest of the ridge because we don't want to deviate from the crest of the ridge. I draw a line of uh, two thirds of the height of the retromolar pad or half the height. And we, I just draw an outline here to show you all the anatomical landmarks we look for in these types of kit and when setting denture teeth. Now, remember that impression we took, I, I showed earlier with the functional impression, the functional bite registration. So this is how we have it unarticulated. Now I have to make a new base plate, so I can't utilize this now. So I have to really record what the doctor gave me. And I, I take a, a putty index and I set up my denture teeth according to that putty index because I have the information from the doctor from the occlusal room. And I'll make a new base plate, as you can see here, and I'll start setting my denture teeth and anterior teeth right up to that, that putty matrix because I know exactly that's where the doctor wanted me to set these teeth. Set my upper anteriors, set my lower, the upper upper is now ready to start with my posterior teeth. So guidelines in selecting posterior teeth, we have to look at what kind of occlusal scheme. We have to determine the degree of the tooth. And then, you know, most of the laboratories and most, most doctors are requesting semi-anatomical tooth and anatomical teeth. We'll talk about uh, lingualized occlusion in a second here, but these are some of the different occlusal schemes out there. You know, some from really anatomical, slightly anatomical on the left-hand side, like a five degree tooth or a monoplane. Uh, all the way to a cuspal inclination of about 33 degrees. So usually different degrees of teeth. Typically, the smaller the ridge, the less degree of the tooth, and the greater the ridge, the greater the degree of tooth. So let's check our notes on setting posterior teeth. We have to make sure the central fossa of the lower is on the, on the ridge. We're going to check our vertical inclination. That's a curve of Wilson. And we curve our speed from anterior, to, uh, from anterior to posterior. As you can see here, this is the curve of Wilson. Buckle to lingual and curve of speed from anterior to posterior. We want to align those occlusal surfaces towards the cranium. That's your curve. That's what I just mentioned. That's your curve of Wilson. The only time I don't do I don't do that is when I'm setting up lingualized occlusion. I don't want that curve of Wilson. I want more of a. Uh, I want to set this flat. You uh, know, using the curve of speed, but I want to align it to the center of the cranium. So speaking of that, let's just touch on, touch on lingualized occlusion now. So lingualized occlusion is perfect for implant cases. It eliminates cheek biting. It's balanced over the crest of the ridge. And a lot of patients, it's more comfortable with lingualized occlusion. Now, I remember the UNC, University of North Carolina, they all, all their full dentures, they used to prescribe lingualized occlusion and had a lot of success with it. So not, it's not only for implant cases, you know, but it's also for full dentures also. So, and, but it's been around a long time. It was in, documented in 1927 by Dr. Alvin Kesey in Switzerland. And it's been you know, popular all these years. It got really more popular when, when uh, more and more implant dentures were being made because that eliminated any off-axis stress on the implant or on a ridge for the full denture also. So like I meant to they're set up horizontally and not illingually inclined and the lingual cusp of the upper goes right into the central fossa of the lower, as you can see here. Fits in like a puzzle, you know, and now we have specialized lingualized teeth on the market. And those buckle cusp on the upper is slightly flared and that, kind, that sort of pushes away the cheek. So, so this physical, and like I mentioned earlier, it's great for implant cases, but you know, they're great for full cases also. We get a lot of cases that we utilize lingualized occlusion. And then let's talk a little bit about physiological centric relation. This is pretty much centric relation where the patient really has that contact with the lower jaw and the upper jaw in a really functional way. 
and it's manipulated easily and it's repeatable. Like I mentioned earlier, it's repeatable without external manipulation and it can be reproduced over, over and over again from the rest position. And it's guided neuromuscularly. So, you know, these, these, and it's comparable to a comfortable upright posture, like I showed earlier, you know, when you're taking that uh, by registration. But let's talk about the degree of oral freedom. You know, we can't, a lot of patients, especially older patients, can't really tolerate that 33 cut degree cuspal inclination. They have a little bit of problem with it. So that's why we go with a little lesser degree. But this is a popular type of uh, occlusion. And there's an average of 10 contact points on the posterior quadrants. And, the contact points are on the working cusps and the lingual cusps of the upper jaw and the buccal cusps of the lower jaw. And there are a few marginal ridge contacts and the anteriors can all have contact or partially have contact. This is where I see a problem though. I like at least one millimeter of overjet and overbite when I'm setting my anterior teeth. And with this, a lot of patients can't tolerate it, but it's, you know, it's functional, you know, so uh, these all represent the general principles of natural dentition. So you can see all the contact points on these on this upper and lower here. So we're going to have that intraorally also, as I'm going to show you in the next photo here. Look at this in, in, look at this setup here. We have tight contact all the way around. Beautiful denture, nice setup, tight contact all the way around. So let's talk about setting the denture teeth. Now I have a couple of different techniques. I want to talk about the template technique. I think this is the most easiest way and predictable way to set denture teeth. And this is using an Artex articulator. So say we didn't get much information from the doctor. Say we didn't get any, any uh, you know, midline, cuspid line, smile line. I have to go by on averages here. So that 40 millimeter interocclusal space ragged rather, and I'm on semi-adjustable or a fully adjustable articular. Our text has both. And you can utilize these templates with other systems out there also. So I trim my base plate. A lot of times I'll expose that papilla to give me an idea, but I'm gonna put this on, a, on the alma gauge anyway to come out about eight to 10 millimeters first from the papilla. So first I'll set these dentures teeth and have that six, six up into anteriors and about 22 millimeters on the anterior. Then I'll follow the guidelines in the upper. I'm gonna check my arrangement on the occlusal plate. You see I have a contact on the centrals and the cuspids and I'll leave those uh, laterals just about a millimeter off the occlusal plate, as you can see here. Then I'm ready to set my lower anteriors. I'm gonna go on an average of about 18 millimeters. So I'm gonna follow the guidelines of the upper. So now we have a nice upper and lower uh, anterior setup. And normally what I would do, I would start setting my upper posteriors, then my lower, I'll do upper and lower, upper and lower, and I'll finish my setup. But then I started using this temp template uh, option. I have a template that attaches to the upper region of the articulator. It's a mag magnetic template. And it helps us achieve occlusion curves of Spee and Wilson and from cuspal degrees from zero to 35 cuspal degrees and cuspal inclinations. So it's really what works well. As a 140 millimeter radius, and it's, it was so easy to utilize. When I first heard about this technique, I said, no, nah, I've been using my own technique for years. It works, but then I, you, you could check the posteriors. I set all my posteriors on the lower. I check it against the template. I have my curve of Wilson, my curve of Spee. And all I'm doing now is gonna look, look at the lingual view. All I'm doing now is following the guidelines of the lower to set my upper posterior teeth. And there's your lower tooth setup. Look how nice and natural that looks. You got the curve of speed, curve of Wilson, beautiful lower setup. I set my upper posteriors against the lower. And there's your final wax up and try I characterize the wax up with different colors to mimic the patient's natural gingiva. And here we have a beautiful try for the patient. There's a closer up look. I get a little, little crazy with this, but you know, I like doing this. You know, we have diagnostic wax ups for crown and bridge. Why can we have a nice uh, uh, characterized wax up on dentures so the patient can see what the denture is going to look like when it's finished? So I utilize various denture waxes, you know, aesthetic colored wax, and you know, I, I precisely shape it. So uh, when I go to a finish, there's less finish, this finishing time. So which one would you prefer, the one on the left or the right? I think I think I hope you would like the one on the right, but you know. So uh, this case has a, on the left has a history to it. I had a, when I saw my laboratory many years ago, I got a call from the doctor said, Dennis, we're not getting these wax ups we used to from our, our, our current lab. This is what they sent me, and look at the difference. So uh, you know, I, I I prefer the one on the right. Yeah, so there we go, nice characterized wax up here. Final setup for trying. You're all finished here, and then that final visit. If everything looks good, we're gonna process it, check for fit, form, and function, check for those pressure spots. And if you have to, you might have to equilibrate that occlusion a little bit, hopefully not. We check that in the laboratory because everything's remounted after, uh, after processing and we check for that occlusion, make sure there's no variances. So we talked about processing techniques earlier and we had, you know, number one is still press back, injection, 
This pour technique, which is a, you know, more of a liquidy technique, more of a high monomer content, uh, is faster. But I still like the either the press pack, the injection, or the microwave technique. A lot of people don't know about the microwave technology that's out there. Um, and it's a specialized flask that you process uh, uh, acrylic in a microwave with specialized uh, monomer that you can cure it in four minutes. And it cures from the inside out. And it's a great processing method and it fits well. All the free monomer is dispersed. So any, anybody who's allergic to denture bases, they don't have any problem with the monomer. So there's conventional impression, investing in packing, as you can see here, still widely used in the industry, but we wanna make sure our denture bases are natural look. We want a natural look, low shrinkage factor, a variety of gingival shades, want a great bond to denture teeth. And you know that's important, especially with the newer denture teeth today. There's such a dense, uh, 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 highly resistant uh, uh, material that you really need a good bond to the denture teeth. So something that's gonna be impact resistance, but also have flexural strength. You can't have one without the other. If you have impact resistant acrylic without flexural strength, it's gonna be brittle. And good finishing and prop, uh, pol pol polishing properties, and of course, color and fit stability. These are just some of the dentures I made just to show the various uh, gingival tones here. And many of these I'm gonna uh, I'll put denture based stain on so just to make it more natural for the patient. But I'm gonna show you some before and after pictures here of some dentures that were made. Look at the difference here. How about this patient here? This one is pretty dramatic, I like this one. Yeah, so uh, kind of kept this pretty close to the same size of the uh, anterior teeth here. In this case, I happen to work on very closely with an oral surgeon and uh, general dentist on Long Island. And this woman's a friend and she, uh, she had came to me, she goes, Dennis, I can't, I'm afraid to smile. She would put a hand over her mouth. She couldn't chew, her teeth were kind of rotted on a lower. So we did an immediate full upper and full lower on this patient and it worked out beautiful. We used the physio dense teeth with a good cuspal inclination, nice and functional. You could see the difference on the left and the right here. Beautiful case. And there's another case here with the physio dense teeth. This is uh, uh, with the denture based stain. This is the, look at it internally. This is that case I was talking about before with this denture, with the denture based stain. Look how natural that looks in the mouth. You know, not, not never gonna know the patient has a denture. Really natural looking. And how about the lower here? Natural looking lower. And the thing to remember on this, these types of cases, especially on the lower, we wanna make sure that we look through original analysis and we create tongue room for the patient, especially if the patient has a big tongue. Because that's going to help with retention also. The artistry through denture technology, this is pretty much back to the basics today. I hope you enjoyed this. If you have any questions, I'm hoping I can answer your questions. But thank you for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it.